Good morning, class. Can everyone hear my audio? Yes, sir. Excellent. Now, you have the, uh, the announcement for Blackboard that tells you about the uh, first exam, the first test, and uh, some of you have asked about that. And remember, the four semester tests count in total 50%. So each semester test counts 12 and a half percent. So don't, don't think that one test counts 50%. That, that's a little bit skewed. So we divide that 50% uh, by four uh, to give 12 and a half percent for the semester test. And then of course the final exam is 30%. That's the largest uh, percentage uh, grade that you have in the class. And that's mandated by the the college, I don't come up with that. So um, what I want to make sure is that uh, when you choose a time, you're gonna have a window between Thursday and Saturday. So I'm providing you flexibility so that you can pick a time that will work best for you. I know you have other classes, I know you have other obligations. So keep that in mind as you choose a time to get prepared uh, for the test. Now today, we're actually going to talk about some things that really I don't think will be as difficult for you, will be a lot of review from college algebra, a polynomial of fundamentals, and also just the basic idea of division of polynomials and how we can actually use uh, that idea to make our life easier uh, as we work through theory of equations. But before I do that, I just wanted to share one item with you. I've gotten a lot of questions. Uh, from you about composition. And um, this is not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just part of, of doing uh, algebra. And what I've noticed with, with this particular problem, I just wanted to just uh, summarize it. Many of you have asked about the composition domain. Now, this one has come up very often. So just to remind you, when you compute the domain of a composition, uh, you have to consider the domain of the inner function, which you normally always do if you're just doing a regular domain. But then you have to make sure once you compose the functions that the inner uh, function range is contained in the domain of the outer function. So what I wanted to do was this example where you compose f with f. It doesn't change anything. You're still doing a composition. So as I just said, I wrote this out and I put something in red over here to make an emphasis of it. The domain of f composed with f, we start with the domain of f, but then of course the range of f must be contained in the domain of f. That's just the definition of composition. And I think, I think in some cases, you're just leaving out one part of this. Either you leave this out or you leave this out. And I don't think you're being careless. I just think you're forgetting about the definition here. So first, if we start with the domain of F, most of you get this. We don't want to divide by zero. So of course we have to exclude negative one. And so that is, that's how you start. Now, if you stop the problem here, you might get lucky because the next part may not provide any additional restriction. But now what we see is we need f of x to be contained in the domain of f. So you, you perform the composition, you compose f with itself. But the issue is here in the denominator. So if we replace x with x over x plus one, we get this x over x plus one plus one in the denominator of the composition. But again, going back to the original idea, we don't want this to be zero because if it is, the, the, the number is not defined. So what I've written here, range of F must be in the domain of F. That's this part that everyone seems to be forgetting. And, and I, I, know you're, I know that when you work these, you think WebAssign is being hard on you, but, but it can't give you credit for something that's incorrect. And of course, it can't give you credit if you don't type correctly. We all are human, so we make typos, and we have to make sure that unless an approximation is requested, we give an exact response. So here's, there's several ways to do this, but I just did this by getting a common denominator. Here we have a common denominator of x plus one. 
and then we collect terms. So when is a fraction uh, not equal to zero? That would mean when the numerator was not equal to zero. So that gives us two X plus one not equal to zero. So when you solve for X, you see X cannot be negative one. So I've done this in the negative. Usually it's better to do these like I've done before in the negative so that you remember you must exclude this. So not only do you have to exclude negative one, but you have to exclude negative one half. So when you do the composition domain uh, in the interval notation, you must exclude these two numbers. And another point too, remember as I do in the smart pen videos, set theoretic notation uses the curly braces like we have here, but interval notation always uses parentheses. So be sure uh, when you're typing that, that you make the distinction between the two. I mean, I guess if you were doing a test and you use curly braces on all the numbers were right, I could, I could overlook that and say, well, okay, you understand what you're doing. But be sure to follow the formatting. The formatting will always be very clear. Uh, it's just easy to overlook because you're focused on doing the computation. So I just wanted to say something about that just to clarify. So I, I appreciate your hard work, but be very careful that you are applying the entire definition of the composition. Uh, it, it really does tell you what to do. Now, what we want to do today is talk about some polynomial basics. And when I say polynomial basics, these are things you actually already know. So we wanna summarize some of these things and do some simple examples. Basically, in general, polynomials are pretty hard to understand in the sense that zeros are not always easy. So what we're gonna do, at least in these initial examples, is to work with polynomials that we can actually understand uh, from their zeros because we have an ability to compute them by factoring. So this will be 3.2. Now remember, all of this material will be covered on the second exam. So nothing we do today will be covered uh, in our first exam. So what I want to call this is just polynomial fundamentals. And this really will remind you of the zero product law. I mean, we, we do it all the time and we don't even think about it. And really, we already know all of this material. So the polynomial fundamentals means that we just start with a polynomial. So for instance, we can use A's as our coefficients, x sub n, this will be what we call the dominant term, I'll say more about that, a sub n minus one, and, and this is what we call writing in descending order, the largest power of x, then the next largest, and we just keep going. And, and the last term would be the constant term, which of course could be, could be zero. So we have the squared term like we have in the quadratic function. Then we have the so-called X term or the linear term, that is the power of X is one. And then we have the constant. So in 3.1, you studied these polynomials right here, the quadratic, and we completely understand the quadratic function. And, and since we do that, understand that, we understand the quadratic polynomial. So this is what you did in 3.1, the quadratic polynomial. Well, we called it function there, but it's still a polynomial. So the idea is if you wanted just to replace that with F and just say F equals this, and then of course we had that really nice uh, second standard form which utilize the vertex, the H and the K, which you've had plenty of practice with. Uh, the quadratic function will continue to serve us well throughout the class and throughout your calculus sequence. So, so again, the more time you spend on this, the better you're gonna be ready for the future. Now, this term here, again, when we talk about a polynomial, we, we talk about a polynomial of degree N. So we assume when you write a polynomial with a dominant term, we assume that a sub n is non-zero. When we actually write the generalized polynomial, we're assuming that the 
first term here in descending order is a non-zero term. We assume a sub n is non-zero and we call a sub n x to the n the dominant term. Dominant term. The idea is when it comes to polynomials, zeros can be very tedious to, to figure out. But we certainly can discern easy attributes or characteristics of a polynomial as x becomes large. And so this is what I want to talk about. We call it the dominant term because indeed it does dominate. So why do we do this? We'll say the dominant term, the dominant term controls the size or magnitude of P of X as X tends to infinity and x tends to something infinitesimally small, negative infinity. So one thing that we do, we have notations that look like this, WebAssign will use these. We'll say x tends or becomes arbitrarily large or x becomes arbitrarily small. Again, when you, when you think of the absolute value of this, you get this, but, but the idea is for polynomials, if we're not restricting domains, then any real input will work. And so when we consider X tending to infinity or X tending to negative infinity, this is a description of end behavior. end behavior. Now all of these phrases are fairly standard and you did talk about these in college algebra. So how does this, how does this impact us? So basically, if, if you're trying to do a really, just basically an easy reasonable sketch of a polynomial, you can easily compute the end behavior by determining what happens to excuse me, by determining what happens to the dominant term as X gets large or very small. And so here's the, here, here are the uh, rules. So first we'll start out with rule one, we'll say N is even. So we have to really figure out the sign. If n is even, and this is in the dominant term, we have, for instance, I'll write this in the uh, a limit notation. We'll say the limit as x tends to infinity of x to the n will just be infinity. So the idea is that if we have like x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, as x gets larger, that particular term x to the n also gets larger. So we say that x to the n tends to infinity. And of course, this just drags the whole polynomial off to infinity because the dominant term controls the size of the polynomial. So, so that's pretty straightforward. Now here, here's another one, number two. And I'll go ahead and write the, let me go ahead and do the uh, negative infinity over here. We'll say limit as X approaches negative infinity. Now, how you do this is just think of a, a, a negative number that's large. I mean, you can just kind of envision it. So when the power is even here, we know that with real numbers, negatives get absorbed. So we could have like X squared, which we know becomes infinitely large on either branch when we, when we actually graph it. So here the negative would actually be absorbed and we still get 
what we call infinity or positive infinity. So we say negative absorbs. So I'm just looking at this based upon just x to the n. Now, of course, n is odd. And when we talk about n being odd, we talk about numbers that aren't integers that aren't even, like one, three, five, or one, one's kind of an interesting number. Um, so we have the limit as x approaches infinity. Well, that's just the same as the first case. We just get infinity. Doesn't matter if it's odd or even, if x is becoming arbitrarily large, this term will also get large, actually larger. And then, of course, if we think about x to the n, as x approaches negative infinity, here the negative will not absorb. So we think of x approaching negative infinity like negative 1,000, negative 5 billion, or whatever. The, the odd power will preserve the negative. That is like x cubed. If you, if you cube uh, negative 3, you get negative 27. The negative does not absorb, so you get negative infinity. So we say negative does not absorb. So this, this idea is basically a sign test. You're thinking, wow, we're doing, we're doing limits at infinity and getting infinity. This is kind of like the worst case of limits in calculus. So we just kind of want to think of an intuitive idea here. So for these particular expressions, as x becomes infinite, we either get infinity or negative infinity. Now, there's one other step to this. Since we have the dominant term here, the coefficient of x to the n can also alter the sign. So for instance, once you think about this, then you have to now include the a sub n. So with the coefficient, with the coefficient a sub n, the sign of infinity can change. So let me give you an example of this. Say we have something like this. Say we have the limit. So we're doing a polynomial that has a leading term like this, negative infinity of negative three x to the fifth. Now, you look at this and say, okay, well, Professor Ron, x to the fifth would be this category right here. That is, as x becomes infinitesimally small, like negative 5 billion, then x to the fifth would also be that way. But now we're seeing that we get the negative of the negative. So this piece here approaches negative infinity but we have the negative that comes along from the coefficient, so we get the negative of negative infinity, which is positive infinity. So you can apply these rules. Once you have these rules, then you must consider the fact if the actual coefficient is negative, it can possibly change the sign. For instance, it can take a positive infinity to negative infinity if it's negative, and it can take a negative infinity to positive infinity. So this is all just a simple sign test. The idea here is very intuitive. When you start raising real numbers to positive integer powers, large real numbers, the result is a larger real number. There's lot, lots of ideas about real numbers that we're going to study in calculus. So what we can see here is that this is like the BV technique we're just trying to figure out what's the sign that we attach to infinity. So this just basically tells you when you do your sketch how the graph will actually tend. Will it, will it be above the x-axis or will it be below? So we'll just say that this is an easy test, easy test for infinity. Now, like I said, when you get the calculus, 
this will kind of be the last thing that you think about. I mean, there, there are all kinds of limits in calculus. You can have limits at infinity and you can have infinite limits. Well, here we have the both. We have the limit at infinity and it is also infinite. So we get the worst possible case here. And these aren't real limits they, because infinity is not a number. So what we wanna do in pre-cal is kind of get your feet wet with thinking about the idea of infinity as it applies to polynomials. So again, very simple, just a simple sign test. Now what we want to do is think about some multiplicities and then we'll do some simple examples. So for instance, P of C equals zero if and only if we say C is a zero of P of X. So if we have a polynomial, for instance, here's a real simple one. Say we have P of X, I'll, I'll do an easy one. Uh, we'll say X minus three squared. It's not, it's not uh, written in descending form, but it is a quadratic polynomial. We can see here that three is a zero. That is three is a zero of p of x since p of three equals zero. Well, you didn't, you didn't need me to tell you that. That's obvious. But what we're gonna find is that sometimes polynomials will factor them and they'll look like this or they'll come to us in factored form or they might be written in the descending order. So we, 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 you know, when we get this, we're like really happy because that tells us what the zero is. Now, what we're noticing here is that this zero occurs twice. That is the multiplicity here is two. And that's gonna tell us about what the graph does uh, in relation to the x-axis. So here we go. So let's do this. So for instance, this is called multiplicity. So for instance, case one, so we're gonna say P of C equals zero. And we'll say N is even. This is what I've been talking about before. So when we say N is even, and I'll just say and X minus C to the N is a factor. We, we factored the polynomial and we get this factor in the uh, representation of, of P of X. Okay, so if N is even, this corresponds to graph of P of X touches the X axis at x equals c. So the idea is here, this, this is actually a sign argument also. I, I don't normally prove this in, in a regular section. I would prove this in an honor section, but that really doesn't matter. It's easy to use. The idea is that when you have an even situation, say here c, here's a possibility the graph will touch at C, it does not cross. So that's what I was talking about with the multiplicities earlier. When we had ones, we knew they crossed and that helped us to do an inequality really quickly. But when we have an even, like a two or a four multiplicity, the graph will touch, it will not cross. So that helps us really quite a bit to get a really reasonable graph of P without a lot of work. And then two, N is odd. Well, then we would say graph of P of X crosses the X axis 
at x equals c. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, the graph could be below the x-axis and just touch. I mean, this is just an example. So here would be something we've done with our inequalities. Say we had something like this. So what would have to happen is that if we had uh, the graph below the axis at c, we do something like this. We would have to cross. So no, notice this is touch and this is cross. So that's what I was doing when I drew a, a, a graph on the number line and I would, you know, I say multiplicity one, so we'd have to cross and then if we hit another one, we'd have to cross. So that was a real simple way to affect the sign test using the multiplicity of the zero. So again, if you're interested in this, you can actually do a proof of this with the division algorithm that we're going to talk about in the next section. But I, I want you to look at this as just an additional assistance in, in getting a graph of a polynomial. Now, I will say this, this is all predicated on the fact that either you're given the factored form or you can actually factor the polynomial. So this only works when you actually know uh, the zero C and how many times it occurs as a factor. So the end behavior, the multiplicities, very, very simple, not, not difficult, but very useful, especially all of this you can take with you along to calculus. And all of this intuition we built up, you will certainly use. So you don't want to forget any of this. Now, let's look at some examples of how we can actually graph a polynomial just using these basic ideas. Now, for instance, here's, a, here's an example, and we want to do several of these. So we use these ideas We use these ideas to draw a reasonable graph. Not, not too specific, just a reasonable graph of P of X. Now again, this is basically like I was saying before, you can't graph something to prove that it's one to one, that's circular. You have to know it's one-to-one, -one, then you can graph it. I mean, I guess if you're, you know, using technology and the technology graphs it because it plots 500 points, that's still not a proof. So what we're doing here is we're analyzing the polynomial with basic information, and then we draw a graph that exhibits the behavior that we've uncovered. But we don't, we don't, you know, it's not a, Rembrandt. We just want to have a, what I, when I say reasonable, sometimes I call this a cheat graph. That is, we just want a basic picture that when I say cheap, we didn't have to spend too much money on it. We didn't have to work too hard. So here's an example. And I'll use, WebAssign uses all kinds of different letters for polynomials. So we have S of X equal three halves X to the sixth minus 2x to the fourth. Now, of course, in the web assign, where they use the computer to draw the graph, the graphs are beautiful, and they just look really nice. And, the, and our graphs aren't going to look that beautiful. But once you figure out the graph, you'll be able to select the correct one. Just remember that the computer-generated graph is going to look a lot more refined. I mean, obviously, we're, you know, that, that's going to be the case. So don't, don't be put out by that, that your graph is not as beautiful. So now, when we look at this particular polynomial, notice here that, that when we talk about degree, the degree of S is six, that's the largest power of X, okay? And so we look at this and say, this is the dominant term, dominant term. So we say dominant. So this is where you can get into calculus class and, and really get a lot of free advice before you even take a derivative or do any calculus at all. So notice if we have a, a degree six here, we notice this is even. 
okay? So we can go ahead, before we do any factoring, just go ahead and do the end behavior. So I want you to get used to this. Uh, uh, WebAssign will do X tends to infinity, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you the limit sign, which is LIM. Go ahead and start using this just to get prepared for calculus. So we'll say X tends to infinity of S of X. Now, of course, we use our rule. First, notice that this coefficient here is positive. So it's not, it's not negative, so we don't have to worry about it altering signs, so to speak. Notice this is an even number, and if we raise the even number, uh, infinity to an even number or a large number, we just get infinity. So that's really easy. Just think, okay, let's substitute 500. X to the 500 to the six is gonna be even bigger. So that's done. So limit as X approaches negative infinity. And again, they'll use these symbols in your web assign. So please pay attention to the symbols, ladies and gentlemen. The web assign is the best computer algebra homework tool in existence. It is, it will make you better, but please, follow the directions. Please follow what's written on the screen. It is a marvelous tool. I believe in it and it can be frustrating at times, but it will make you better. Now, notice here, if X, take your favorite negative number, like negative a thousand. Notice when we substitute here, the six will absorb that negative. So we know this is also infinity. So we think of this like a quadratic polynomial. On either end, the, the curve will be above the x-axis because of the end behavior, in this case being the negative being absorbed, all right? So, so again, this was easy. That was just a positive coefficient, so we didn't have to go to the next level. So, so this is very straightforward. Please, please take this and work with it and, and get comfortable with it. Now we're thinking, well, we need to kind of figure out if we have any zeros. So now we're thinking, well, you know, Professor Ron likes to factor everything. So let's go ahead and factor this. That's why we've been factoring like crazy people from the beginning. So notice we have an X to the fourth in both of these, and we can go ahead and factor the three halves as the leading coefficient to move it to the left. So we have three halves, X to the fourth, now, of course, that takes all of this away except for x squared. And now notice we need to counter the three halves. We'll just make that, flip it, and make it a two thirds times the two. And then of course the x to the fourth uh, we got rid of. Now, notice here, this is the trick I've been teaching you when it comes to this. And let's see here, let me, let me check the, Focus. I always like the focus to be good. There we go. That's that's a little bit sharper. Now, notice when we multiply through, check your work here. We have x to the six and the three halves, so that's right. And then here, when we multiply the two third and the three halves, they absorb, and we're left with negative two x to the fourth. So that's a good factorization. So now let's keep going. So we have three halves. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and put in an x minus zero here because it's there, it's just not written. So we have the four there. And then now we've got a difference of squares, but let me go ahead and simplify this. That's a four over three. So we have three halves, x minus zero to the fourth. And now, of course, this is a difference of two squares. So this is x minus, and of course, the square root of that, that will be two over square root three. Don't worry about it being rather un, untoward. You know, we got a radical in the denominator, but that's fine. Sometimes we move it upstairs. And then we get x plus two over square root three. So the idea here is now, we're well, just to go ahead and put in a one there, okay? So we've got three zeros. Zero is a zero of multiplicity four. So we can say, let's just write down the zeros. 
and then we'll say multiplicity just to catalog it. These are fun problems. You'll enjoy these, and and you already know how to do them. We just have to kind of put all this I, these ideas together. So now we have zero, which is a zero. It's funny we do the factor theorem in the next section. I'll review that, but we're already using it now. So I I, I think authors of pre-cal books find it difficult to decide how to introduce things, but Dr. Stewart has done an excellent job with this book. And we see multiplicity four. Now we have a zero two over root three of multiplicity one. And then here, if we put in the additional minus, 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 we have a negative two over root three of multiplicity one. So when we when we factor, and this is this is important, ladies and gentlemen, we have a polynomial that admits to a factorization. We, we know that in a lot of cases, we have to do more, you know, uh, elaborate factorization to, to even find or hope to find the zero. But in most of the uh, problems in this section, you will be able to factor and figure out uh, what's going on, uh, basically, as we've done here. So now we can say, touch, cross, cross. So we just put that to the side. If you want, we can just kind of do this and just say graph. And know that we have even multiplicity, we must touch. We have odd multiplicity here, we must cross. So this is enough to get what we call a reasonable graph. So let's do that. Now, I'm not worried about values here. We're not going to be so focused on the value of the function. We just want to know where it is relative to the x-axis. And we want to make sure it touches or crosses the x-axis at the zeros. And we want to exhibit the end behavior. So you don't have to sit here and compute values of all of these. That's not what I'm asking you to do. We want cheap. We just want a, a quick graph. So here. Again, don't, don't worry about plotting a bunch of F values or S values. So here, and to make our work a little bit easier, notice here that uh, square root of three is less than uh, two. I mean, it's, it's like a 1.7. So these are a little bit bigger than one. So we can kind of guesstimate. So we'll put a one here and a negative one here. And we'll go ahead and spread out too. We spread out the x-axis so we can see everything. And so we can say we've got this zero about right here and this zero about right here. So this approximates these two zeros. And then of course the zero of zero is right there. Now, these are all the zeros. And we have an end behavior that says infinity. So basically, we have to, above the x-axis, we have to cross, then we have to touch, and then we have to cross. But notice, this, this particular polynomial is, is very nice. It's even. We have all these even powers. We see s of x is even. It has the nice symmetric domain, all real numbers. And then of course, S of the additive inverse of X is just S of X because all the negatives absorb with the even powers. So when, when we think about this, we have to cross, touch, and then cross. So we can try to make it look nice and symmetric. So don't worry about, we, we're not gonna figure out the minimum here until we take calculus. So don't worry about it. So we have this, and then we touch. It's going to really hug close because of that fourth power there. And then we cross again, symmetric here, and then something like this. Again, this is what we call a reasonable graph. In order to figure out 
what the minimum value of the function would be here, we would have to utilize some calculus. So I'm not asking you to do that. All I'm asking you to do is say, okay, and even if you missed the fact that the function was even and you didn't have y-axis symmetry, that would still not be an issue. You know now that we're above the axis, as we hit these zeros, we must cross. So we cross and then here at zero, we must touch and then we must cross and that's it. Again, a lot of the, uh, what we call these are relative extrema, like a relative minimum here, this will require the uh, uh, techniques of calculus. So this is what I mean. I don't want you to plot a bunch of values of S. That's not the purpose of this exercise. The purpose is to use the end behavior, use the zeros in their multiplicity to get a reasonable graph. And if there's some simple symmetry here, then use it. But again, as the multiplicity gets higher, this, this part of the curve really hugs the area around the uh, zero. And on the web assign, you'll see that it looks like it's just meshed in there because again, the powers here will affect the quality of the graph. Now, of course, in calculus, we'll figure out what the concavity is and we won't have to just kind of think, well, it's gonna look like this, but this is what we call a reasonable graph. If you're in a science class and you just need to sketch a reasonable graph of a polynomial, you could use these techniques. And then all your friends will say, well, how do you know this? Well, they'll say, well, we just do this in Professor Ron's class. It's a standard technique to work a problem to, to get some, some kind of visual of the graph without having to work too terribly hard, okay? So this makes a good example. Now, I want to say some things. When, when you do the other problems, you may have to use some factoring techniques that we've already talked about, and that'll be easy. But now what I want to do is to talk a little bit about the division algorithm. So remember, everything we've done with factoring in behavior and multiplicity will now allow you to do most of section 3.2, every problem's the same. So, so, so you'll, you'll, by the time you finish that section, you can tutor individuals with this. Now, so that was the basic part. Now we wanna get a little bit more theoretical, but not a lot. We wanna talk about division. We know how to divide we know how to divide uh, numbers and the division of polynomials should be the same. So now let's go ahead and write this down. This is called the division algorithm. So this is a theorem, theorem. I'll just abbreviate that THM and we'll call this the division algorithm. And let me, let me close my, my uh let me move this out close the email because i don't want it dinging while we're in class so let me get back to here so now okay so that looks good so we have the division algorithm Now, what is this? I like what Dr. Stewart does with this particular uh, setup here. That is, he uses, he uses letters for the polynomials that, that signify what they represent. So let, we'll use P of X. I, you know, friends, you can use whatever letter you want when you're doing your own work, but when you do web assign, and, and this was what I've noticed, you must adhere to the independent variables that are given in the problem. If you're solving for Fahrenheit given Celsius, then the independent variable is C. If you're solving for Celsius given Fahrenheit, 
then then the independent variable is f you can't just change it to x Webassign will mark it wrong. So you must use the variables that are given in the problem. And I know it's easy to forget that, uh, but, but please be careful with that. They always give you the formatting to the right or left of the box that tells you what you should be using. So be, be careful with that. So let P of X and D of X be polynomials. where, and we're going to assume here that the degree of D is at least one. So we don't want the D to be a number. Degree zero is just a number. And so we're not really interested in that, that we know how to divide numbers. The division of algorithm, excuse me, is the same uh, for dividing numbers. It's just that, that we've got those X's, those indeterminates hanging around. Then there exists Unique polynomials. So we use D for divisor. Unique polynomials. We'll call this Q of X, Q for quotient, and R of X, R for remainder. Such that. Such that in this case, we divide, that is P of X, and the order here doesn't matter. You could write D of X first or Q of X. It won't matter. It makes no difference at all. Polynomials are commutative just like real numbers. Plus R of X. Now, again, when you divide P of X by D of X, you get a quotient and a remainder. And the remainder either has degree zero but it must be strictly less than that of the divisor. So this pretty much tells you when you stop dividing. I mean, when the, when the actual remainder is less than the divisor, so to speak, we think about numbers, that makes sense. We think about a polynomial being less than another polynomial when it has lower degree. So that's, that's like we say, we say two uh, is, is less than five. And then we could think if we were dividing, we would say 2x uh, has, is less than, say, a polynomial of degree 2, thinking about it this way. So this basically says, when do we stop dividing? And, and the remainder would have to satisfy this degree requirement. Now, alternatively, We could write this just divide through by D. We could say P of X divided by D of X. Again, the, the D's uh, would absorb and we're just left with the quotient plus R of X divided by D of X. So this is actually very popular when we're thinking about uh, slant asymptotes. Sometimes we like to write rational functions this way because it gives us more detail. So here's, here's one version here. And here's another version right here. Now, let's just look at a simple example of this uh, where, where we actually can introduce what we call uh, something very simple uh, called synthetic division. But before I do that, I want to state a theorem that's going to be uh, a result of the division algorithm. Division algorithm is, is uh, a little bit more complicated to prove. It can be done with induction. Uh, it can be done by contradiction. Uh, the thing is, is that this is a major result. And, and so it does take a little bit more care uh, to prove. Now, a result of this is called the remainder theorem. And this, this is, a theorem that we use over and over. Just to save a little bit of time, I'll usually abbreviate theorem THM. So, we, you know, we, you can write it out like this theorem. So just to save some time, I'll just do THM. 
that's not a standard abbreviation, but it's what I do. So I don't want you to get confused. Remainder theorem. So we'll just start out with C, a real number, even though it could be complex. I mean, it could be, it could be imaginary. Of course, a real number is complex, but it could have imaginary parts. So C is a real number and suppose P of X is a polynomial. So P of X is a polynomial. The number, excuse me, if P of X, I was gonna to skip to the factor theorem, but I'll wait on that. If P of X is divided by X minus C, that is, this is a very unique divisor here. Notice it's degree one and it's monad. That is the leading coefficient is one and it's degree one. So we call this monic, monic of degree one. Monic means that the leading coefficient is one. And then degree one means the power of X is one. Okay, so this is very special. So when we talk about the remainder theorem, uh, you cannot use the remainder theorem unless you have this special divisor. So if P of X is divided by X minus C, then, and this is just a direct result of this, then the remainder, this remainder right here is actually P evaluated at C. Now, what's nice about this, you're thinking, well, okay, fine. How, how that's somewhat helpful, but how is it helpful? The idea is that we can use a technique called synthetic division to apply this result. So, and I'll say something about that. We can use synthetic division, and I'll talk to you about this, synthetic division to efficiently use, to efficiently, efficiently, that's the big word, to efficiently, efficiently yeah, I can't even speak, efficiently use, I'm just gonna give up because I can't seem to be able to say it, use the remainder theorem. I'll just say we need to be efficient when we use the remainder theorem. That'll be easier. How funny. When I finally get rid of these Invisalign, hopefully I'll be able to get these uh, long syllable words more aptly. Uh, my orthodontist said you'll, you'll have trouble saying certain words and, and, and this is very true. So now let's look at an example. So basically what we're thinking here is this is a way to evaluate polynomials. Not only can we figure out if we have a zero, we can also just use it as a method to evaluate polynomials. So let's look at an example. So say we have something simple like this. Now, when you do your web assign, you'll have some simple examples of this, but let's see here. Let's look, let's look at something simple like this. So let P of X be six X squared plus X and D of X equal x plus one. Now, this could be written like this. For instance, you could just write it as a, uh, as a ratio. Six x squared plus x divided by x plus one. So, so here's the polynomial, here's the divisor. So basically divide p of x by d of x or do this, what does this equal? 
Well, actually, we could figure this out. We, are, we can do use the remainder theorem, then I'm going to show you the synthetic division. First, notice that this is a special type of divisor, but we have to have the x minus the c. So notice this is x minus negative 1. When you use the remainder theorem, you must use the hypothesis that the div divisor D, the monic polynomial of degree one is written as X minus C. So now we see that the C is negative one. Equivalently, C equals negative one. So this is really important. So now you're thinking if I divide P of X by this special polynomial x plus 1, the remainder should just be p of negative 1. So we say p of c equals p of negative 1. And these are easy. You, normally, I factor this stuff. You know, you can write this this way if you like. You can write this as x times 6x plus 1. You can always factor things to make them easier to evaluate. So now we'll just substitute negative 1. So we get negative 1 and 6 times a negative 1 plus a 1. So we have negative 1. And then, of course, we have a negative 6 plus a 1, which is a negative 5. And then negative 1 times negative 5 is 5. So, so 6x squared plus x divided by x plus 1 in this case is the actual remainder. So, so when we think about this, we're, we're, you know, I'm like, say, what is this? So, and I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna put a blank here. So now we've got the remainder, let's figure out what the quotient is. So now let's, and, and we'll verify that we get this through the process of synthetic division. So here's what we're gonna do. Synthetic will only work with these special divisors. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to start with descending order and put the coefficient 6 and a 1, and then the constant term 0. So any spaces that are left in the powers of x, we want to put a 0. Since there's no constant term, we put a 0 here. And then we take the c and we put it right here. So this is synthetic division, synthetic division. So we're doing the remainder theorem with the uh, division algorithm. So how do we do synthetic? I, and I do it my way. I don't do a lot of extra stuff where you have an extra line that doesn't make any sense. So what we do, again, when you do the regular polynomial division, that's a waste of time because this is so simple. You bring down the leading coefficient. And then you say 6 times negative 1 is a negative 6 and add it to 1. You get a negative 5. This I want you to add in a visual way. I don't want you to put an extra line here because I want this all to make sense. So bring the leading coefficient down, multiply by the C. 6 times negative 1 is negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. Done. That's the, that's the procedure. Then you do it again. Negative five times negative one is positive five. Positive five plus zero, five. So now, that's exactly what this is. So that's my remainder, but the remainder theorem already told me it would be five, but that's my quotient right there. So this equivalently says, that we have a quotient of one degree less, 6x minus 5. So the idea here is that when we divide, we get a very interesting situation here. So now we have 6x minus 5 plus 5 divided by x plus 1. So this form here is what I've written here. Okay? Or, if you like, we can equivalently write 
six x squared plus x equals x plus one times six x minus five plus five, and that's equivalent. So we can write it this way, this form, or we can divide by d. So what's nice about this is we kind of do a twofer here. We say, all right, well, if I want to divide a polynomial by a monic polynomial of degree one, this special x minus c, so to speak, I can go ahead and figure out the remainder. Maybe, maybe the problem just says, what's the remainder? And then if I like, because this is so simple, I can choose the synthetic division process. And synthetic division will give me the quotient, the reduced polynomial for free, and the remainder, which I already knew. So the synthetic division is very powerful. P of negative one is five, but five or P of negative one is also the remainder. So now I can fill this in and say, well, this is six X squared plus X divided by X plus one is the quotient plus the remainder divided by the divisor. Or I can just multiply three by X plus one and write it this way. So we have this form, which WebAssign will ask you to write, and we have this form, which WebAssign will also ask you to write. Now, this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't think about what we're doing here, you can really confound this. This is a little bit harder than the cheap graphs of the polynomials. But what we're seeing, and, and, and this is where the power of the synthetic comes in, when we're trying to test for zeros of polynomials with the rational zeros theorem, which will come up next week, we're going to find that this technique with the synthetic is very, very useful. So now we can basically see here that clearly negative one is not a zero. Well, you didn't need me for that. You know what the zeros are. Notice, let's go ahead and factor P of X. Well, we've got it here, so I'll, I'll start again. So now what I'll do is what I did with the first problem last time. I'm going to factor a 6x out of both terms. So we have a 6x, and that leaves us with an x. And then, of course, we have to pay for the 1 6, pay with 1 6, because now 6x times 1 6 will give us x, and 6x times x is x squared. And so now if we set this to zero, we have 6x equals zero or x plus 1 6 equals zero. So we get x equals zero, which you already knew, or x equal negative 1 6. Okay, so we knew, we knew that this is not a zero. You can see that it's not a zero. These are the zeros right here. So let me just do a little, another exercise. So now you can see where we're going to head with the synthetic division. So now, if we wanted to look at this problem a little bit more closely, we could do the same thing again. We could have the six, the one, and the zero. So again, P of X is, 6x squared plus x. And now we know we know the zeros, we just figured them out. The zeros are zero and negative one six. So let's test. Let's see. Let's see if the remainder theorem works. Okay, well, let's put in zero here. Well, notice x minus zero. So that means c is zero. And then of course we have x minus a negative one six. So we put in zero, bring the six down. Six times zero is zero. And then we get zero plus one is one. One times zero is zero, zero plus zero is zero. So that's the remainder of zero. So we know zero is a zero. Sorry, zero is a zero, right? Let's try negative one six. Bring the six down. Six times negative one six is negative one. Negative one plus one is zero. And zero times negative one six is zero. Zero plus zero is zero. So boom, right there. So so the idea here is when we when we do synthetic, what we're seeing here is we get two remainders of zero. 
So this again verify, well, we already knew this. You wouldn't need to do this. I'm kind of just doing it two different ways. Maybe you were just checking on zeros of this and someone said, okay, here are two candidates, see if they're zeros. Well, they are because the remainder is zero. So anytime you divide using synthetic and you get a zero remainder, you autom automatically know that these are actual zeros of the polynomial. So, so the trick here, for instance, we would not need to do anything that elaborate for this polynomial because we can easily find the zeros by factoring like we did in the previous section. So we would not need really to use synthetic division. But what I'm trying to show you here is that we would get the same result. That is, when you think about this, synthetic division will allow you to test any number that you believe to be a candidate for a zero, like you're gonna do in the rational zeros theorem. So together with the rational uh, remainder theorem, synthetic division gives us a powerful tool, not only to check for zeros, but to basically just evaluate polynomials. So this is a, this is a, wanna say, uh, useful, useful tool very useful. So that's a good thing. Now, let's look at some other examples. One thing we want to do is just maybe do a division where we don't have synthetic division. That is maybe, maybe we've got a polynomial divisor that doesn't fit into this nice category. So let's do one of those and just practice. And then we'll uh, start, we'll start making some polynomials. We'll create some polynomials with specific uh, characteristics. So for instance here, let's see, I've got one. Um, yeah, here we go. Let's do this one. Let's say that we've got uh, P of X equals 10 X to the fourth plus four X cubed plus seven X squared. And the divisor will be two X squared plus one. And what we wanna do this time, let's just go ahead and say, we'll, we'll, we won't do the fraction this time. We'll just say we want to write P of X equal D of X times Q of X plus R of X. So, we want that form, so we need to figure out the, the quotient and the remainder. Now, this does not fit the synthetic. That is, this does not equal an X minus C. I mean, there, no way. I mean, even if you had a three X in there, it still wouldn't work. It has to be Monica degree one. So no, no synthetic. I start off with the synthetic because it's so powerful and so easy to do. And the, the, the rows tell us many things about the polynomial. But if we don't have this special divisor form, do not use the synthetic. It, it, it's a waste of time. It, it will give you nonsense. So now what we do is we just divide like we're dividing uh, numbers, 2x squared plus 1. and we write everything again in descending order. And then we put in placeholders for, for value or powers of X that are not there, like a zero X plus a zero, just like we do with synthetic. So to keep all the columns aligned, go ahead and put in placeholders, even though you probably know that there's nothing there except zero, it, it gives you a little more organization. And of course, if we had the cube term missing, that is the coefficient with zero, we could just put a zero X cubed or, or zero there as a placeholder to keep everything aligned. So now we just divide like we normally do. We have 10 X to the fourth divided by two X squared. So we just think of dividing monomials like this. And of course, two divides the 10 five times. And then of course, X to the fourth divided by X squared is just X squared using the laws of exponents. So 
this this is very straightforward. Of course, we have to work a little bit harder if we don't have nice divisibility. Now, just like you're multiplying numbers, then you multiply this term by the divisor to see what remains. So we say 5x squared times 2x squared, which is, we know that's true. That's going to absorb when we subtract. And then we have 5x squared times a 1. That's not a cube, so we put this right here to keep the columns aligned. And then, of course, we subtract. So we're just doing like we're doing regular uh, division of numbers. Even though this seems so much more formal, this is what we do when we talk about numbers. So now we subtract, we're looking for a remainder. So of course the 4x cubed comes downstairs here. And then the uh, 5x squared from the 7x squared is a 2x squared. Now we do a little check, the division algorithm, we know we have to keep going as long as the degree of the remainder is equal to or bigger than the degree of the divisor. That's what the theorem tells us. And so this is degree three, that's degree two. So we have to keep going. So now we're gonna divide four x cubed by two x squared. Again, two into four is two, and x cubed minus divided by x squared will just give us an x. So you can do a little sidebar there if you like. So this gives us plus two x. Now this is easier than synthetic, but, but again, we don't have any choice because we can't use synthetic with this divisor. And so now we multiply 2x times 2x squared is the 4x cubed, which we already knew. And now we have 2x times a 1. Well, it doesn't go here. It's going to go over here under the x column. So now we look at this and say, okay, well, let's subtract and see what the remainder is with this process. So when we subtract these absorb, of course, this is just a zero here. So we get 2x squared, and that's just a 0x there. And so we get a negative 2x. Now let's compare. Notice this is degree one, and this is degree, excuse me, degree two, and this is degree two, they're equal. So again, we look back here and say, we're not here yet. It's not strictly less. That is the remainder of all remainder here actually equals the degree of the divisor. So the theorem says keep going. So we'll do it again. So we have 2x squared divided by 2x squared. Well, that's just one. Well, that was easy. So now we have plus a one. So one times 2x squared gives us 2x squared. And then one times one, well, that's just positive one, but that's gonna go over here since it's not an X uh, uh, degree or an uh, X uh, expression, just a constant. Now we subtract to see what the remainder is with this process. These absorb and we're left with what? Negative two X. And then of course here we have a zero. So zero minus one is negative one. So now we look and say, okay, now this degree is one, this degree is two. We Stop. Stop. Because again, we see that the degree of negative 2x minus 1 is strictly less than the degree of 2x squared plus 1, the divisor. So, so there's no guesswork here. This, the, the, the division algorithm is really powerful because it gives us the remainder theorem and it gives us a way to break things down. It gives us a way to define division of polynomials in a way that we can do just like we are dividing numbers. So it's the same process, it's just now we have these X's hanging out and we have to contend with them. So now this equivalently, so here's the quotient. This is the quotient and this is the remainder. So what, what we see here is in the previous problem with the synthetic here, we get the quotient that's to the left of the remainder. And then we have to put in the X's. Degree one degree less, six X minus five, and then there's a the remainder. Here, 
it's all kind of on a silver platter. We don't have to work as hard. So now we say, we'll do this, P of X, which is 10 X to the fourth plus four X cubed plus seven X squared. This will equal, so we'd say D, two X squared plus one times the quotient, five X squared plus two X plus one plus the remainder. So we could just say plus negative two X minus one, or you can just do minus two X minus one. Your choice. If you don't want to put parentheses in your web assign, you could just write minus two X minus one. But I just wanted to kind of showcase everything here. So here's your uh, divisor, here's your quotient, and here's your remainder. So it looks exactly like that. And of course, this is P of X. So, so the idea here is when we're working with rational functions, it's actually nice to be able to do this. This is how we can maybe consider uh, uh, asymptotes, vertical and horizontal, and maybe if we have a slant asymptote or a quadratic asymptote, we don't spend much time past the slant asymptotes. Uh, but, but when you take your physics and engineering classes, uh, and even more calculus classes, you will see the uh, occurrence of those. So what we want to do here is just make sure that we see that the division algorithm is extremely powerful. It gives us a way to treat polynomials like numbers. And, and then we get some nice results because of it. Now, I want to note another result that we have with the polynomials that comes from the division algorithm. And this is called the factor theorem. So that was, so we have factor theorem. I'll go ahead and write this out. Now the proof, the proof of the, uh, I may say something about the proof of the remainder theorem. It's actually really straightforward. It's not, it's not difficult at all. It uses the uh, division or al algorithm directly. So we may say a little bit about that. But the factor theorem goes the same way. So we're going to say, let's see be a real number, even though it could be complex, we'll just focus on this. And P of X is a polynomial. I guess constant polynomials wouldn't have any zeros, but, but we can always uh, you know, consider that case. So we'll say the number C, in this case, the number C, and you already know this, is a zero. So this is a formal, this is a formal statement of what it means for a real number or even complex number to be a zero of a polynomial. The number C is a zero of P of X. I mean, you can, WebAssign will ask you to write this down 500 different ways, but the main thing is that we're using the, uh, in this case, the uh, factor theorem. The number C is a zero of P of X, if and only if X minus C is, now we got that famous little, you know, monic degree one is a factor of P of X. And that's basically thinking about the zero product. That is, there must be, there must be a factor in P of X that will annihilate the polynomial. That is, this must occur in order to zero out the polynomial, so to speak. So if this isn't there, you don't get this and vice versa. So this is a very powerful tool and we use it, we've been using it from day one but we've never formally written it like this. So, so now, for instance, like we had before, let's look at some examples of this. For instance, um, here's an example. Prove, and, and you're thinking this is like blown out of proportion. Prove, um, in this case, that X minus three 
is a factor of p of x. And you can do these many different ways. If uh, WebAssign asks you to write something in a box to describe it, then describe it. Use your own words. This is just the binomial theorem here, so this is easy. <laughs> it's a very simple problem. But, but the thing is, it says prove that x minus 3 is a factor of this polynomial. That, that's a 1, 3, 3 something. Not quite the binomial theorem, but, but, but close to it. So when we look at this, we have p of x, like I said before, x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 9. And we have this factor, x minus 3. Prove this is a factor. So we just have to show this is a 0. So we could just substitute. You know, but that's too difficult. First, observe that C is 3. So this is a special, this is the special polynomial that we use for synthetic. So let's just show that the remainder is 0. Let's just use synthetic because this is the most efficient way to do it. Efficiently. Now I can say it. <laughs> You have to. You just have to kind of let it go when you when you can't say it. Just let it go, rest, and then come back to it. So uh, we've got what one negative three, three negative nine, and our c is three. So let's test. So we know that this would be a factor if we can prove that three is a zero. So we can use the factor theorem directly. So now bring the one down. 1 times 3 is 3. 3 plus negative 3 is 0. 0 times 3 is 0. 0 plus 3 is 3. 3 times 3 is 9. 9 plus negative 9 is 0. So that's good. So basically now we see the remainder. The remainder is 0. So uh, remainder equals 0 but that equals p of 3. By factor theorem, by factor theorem, x minus 3 is a factor of p of x. Now, the beauty of the synthetic is that it gives us so much extra stuff because there's the quotient right there. So equivalently, P of x is what x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 9. And so we've got our factor here, x minus 3. So this is the division algorithm like we did on the last problem. And there's the quotient right there, x squared plus 3. So the, the reduced, the reduced here by degree one, that is now you decrease by one power. And so there's your x squared term, the x term is zero and the constant is three. So there's the quotient right there. And of course, plus zero, we don't add that. But now you can see that the other factors are easily done uh, by, uh, by looking at this factor. So now you're thinking, all right, well, Professor Ron, x squared plus 3 is never 0. That has imaginary. That is, these, these have i's in them, plus or minus square root 3i, because this particular uh, factor here is never uh, anything but positive. So this can never be 0. So now, now we can look at this and say, well, by using the synthetic, We've now uncovered the fact that the remaining zeros here are imaginary. So the power, the power of the synthetic is that not only does it verify uh, the existence of a factor, i.e. the existence of a zero, it also gives you the reduced. So now we could just keep going, and this is what we'll do in the later sections. This will just be what x minus 3. And now, of course, this is where we think, okay, well, how can, how can we write this in a way that it's going to work? Notice this will be x minus 
square root three i. This is just the kind of giving you a review of what's up to come. And x plus the square root of three i. So we think of this as a difference of squares, but they're imaginary because of course i squared is negative one and root three times root three will give us the three with the negative. So that gives us the positive uh, three there. So what we're seeing here is that now we have a complete factorization. That is x minus three, x minus root three i, and then we can put in two negatives, x minus negative root three i. You don't always have to do this. I'm just trying to show you that now the three zeros, we have an x minus a three, an x minus a root three i, and x minus a negative root three i. So, so again, just remember, x squared plus three is always positive. So zeros are imaginary. And since it's, it's a simple quadratic, we can easily hear, and we'll say more about this later, we can easily use the uh, imaginary unit to figure out what the remaining zeros are. So this is an example of a polynomial that we can actually understand because we can use factoring techniques to find the zeros. Now, in many cases, the zeros don't admit to this type of factorization, and, and we must maybe uh, try to uh, get to the actual solution by different means, or the, the, what we might have to do if we're an, an engineer is do some type of Newton's method technique to give a reasonable approximation of, of zeros. So, so again, um, when you work physics problems and engineering problems, it, they very well be the case that you end up with imaginary zeros, but they still impact the real world solution. That's where people and, and individuals got kind of crazy when, when the complex variables were introduced and we had these imaginary units and everybody was like, well, you've made this up, it doesn't make any sense, but, but we, have to, we have to delve into the area of the imaginary and the complex analysis to actually understand some aspects of real analysis. So, so the algebra here gives us an introduction to that. So this should remind you of some ideas that you did in your college algebra class. And of course, we'll come back to this, but I just wanted to go ahead and throw that out there to remind you of how we deal with uh, quadratic factors of this nature, okay? So now, let's look at an example where we actually build a polynomial. So for instance, we have the division algorithm, we have the remainder theorem, and now what we want to do is think about, okay, well, if we're trying to build a polynomial, how can, how can we build a polynomial? So here's, here's a web assign example. So here's an example. So we have, uh, I'll just say build, build a polynomial. Now, depending on, ladies and gentlemen, depending on how much information the problem gives you, it may, it may be the fact that you write a unique polynomial. Less information would be that you would come up with a polynomial that's not necessarily unique. But in this case, uh, here are the characteristics. We want degree four, degree four. Uh, some zeros will be the following. We want negative one, one, and the square root of two. And Okay, and also we want P of X to be written as an integer polynomial. That is, we want, we want the coefficients to be integers. So this means integer polynomial. We want integer polynomial, like three, four, negative five, things like that. No fractions, no, no irrational numbers like square root of three as coefficients. And also the problem requires that the constant term be six. Now this is kind of predicated on the fact that this will work out. Um, there are other ways to do this, but at this point in time, 
We just simply look at what we have and then we make any adjustments to, to get to this particular state here. So this is something we affect at the end. We don't want to try to do this too early. So this is something that, that will be later. Now, what we can do is use the factor theorem. Factor theorem, like the remainder theorem, is very powerful. And it's simple. So we'll have a zero here. And then, of course, we'll have our factor here. All right. So for negative one and one, this is probably the easiest part. We need what? X plus one or X minus a negative one. So, so again, if negative one is a zero, we must have a factor that is annihilated by negative one. So we can do x minus a negative one or just be lazy and write x plus one. Now, of course, if we want a zero of one, we need the x minus c. So here, this is x minus c, which is x plus one. And here, x minus c, x minus one. Factor theorem. There's a zero, there's the factor. c, x minus c, c, x minus c. So, so here, again, direct use of the factor theorem. Now we've got square root of two. But you're thinking, well, then we just need x minus the square root of two, because that would be c is the square root of two. Okay, that would be fine if we didn't have this. If we were just asked for a real polynomial and we didn't specify integer, then we'd be fine. So we have to think about this and say, well, we've got to kind of couple these two together. So if we have this and we need integer, then we're going to have to use x squared minus 2. That is, this is actually what? x minus the square root of 2 and x plus the square root of 2. So in order to keep integers, we have to move to the quadratic factor. So if this were not required here, then we could just do x minus square root of two. And then of course our coefficients would have irrational numbers in them. And we don't spend a whole lot of time with that. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that kind of polynomial. But again, we have to follow what WebAssign asks us to do. So again, we have to move to the quadratic. So, so again, when you think about this, you can, like I say, you can start out by that. And then you're thinking, oops, I don't, I can't deal with that as a coefficient, so let me let me move to the quadratic factor. So this is a this this is just like the last problem where we had this. We had x squared plus three. So that that gives us these automatically. So if we were going to go backwards and we needed this factor, uh, and and we were told that we couldn't have uh, coefficients with imaginary units in them, then we'd have to move to that factor, which would give us two of them. But here's the deal. The thing is, we need degree four, and so this, this kills two birds with one stone. So now we get this, and we get this for free. So we have one, two, three, four. So we've got our degree here, We've got our zeros here, this additional one right here, the negative square root of two, and we've got that. So that's actually good. So by doing this, we get that for free. So if we had tried to focus on that, we still wouldn't have gotten that. So we would have been forced to move to this. Now, what does this imply equivalently? So we've got all these factors, we can just multiply them together. So we'll say this gives us x plus one times x minus one, and we'll just go here, x squared minus two. We won't call it anything yet because we're not, you know, we're not there yet. We'll, we'll, we'll just go ahead and see what we get. So this is a difference of two squares. So this is x squared minus one, right? That's the, what this is. And then we have x squared minus two. So now we'll distribute. So this will be x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. And then x squared times negative two minus two x squared. And then negative one times x squared minus x squared 
and then negative times a negative plus two. Now let's go ahead and combine terms, x to the fourth minus three x squared plus a two. And here's a little trick that, that keeps us from having to use the fundamental theorem of algebra yet, but I don't really care how you do it. Usually in the smart pen videos, I just say figure out what the leading coefficient needs to be to have a particular uh, uh, constant term. But notice here, we can easily do that. We can multiply a polynomial by any number and not change the zero. So now notice if we need a six here, we can just simply multiply this polynomial by three to get the six. So this implies that we'll do three times x to the fourth minus three x squared plus two. And that'll give us three x to the fourth minus nine x squared plus a six. And if you like, we can call that P of X now. I didn't really give anything a name yet. I just used the factor theorem. So now we can see that when we look at this particular polynomial, it satisfies all the characteristics and it is indeed unique. In this case, we, we, have, we have enough specification here that, that we, we, we have a unique polynomial. And that is indeed, that is indeed unique. We've got the constant uh, term of six. We have integer coefficients. We have all of these zeros in that, in that degree. Now, of course, you could try to mix and match here. Um, you're, and and this, is, this is, I guess, what's very important here. You're thinking, well, if, if we're forced to have this factor, that pretty much tells us we've got to have this. The thing is, we're, we're going to be stuck with this if we don't do this, because you're thinking, well, okay, well, let me just use another zero besides the negative square root of two. Well, you can, but you'll still be stuck with the square root of two, which will violate this. So what's nice about these problems is that they use very, very basic techniques, nothing complicated, but you have to see this, and this is, this is the power of doing mathematics, and this is what they say moving from college algebra level to pre-cal and then up to calculus. There has to be a transition. So now you're thinking, well, I've seen all of this before. Now maybe I'm looking at it a little bit differently. And just remember when we do our synthetic, we, we do a visual addition uh, and we, we make sure that every row means something. We don't, we don't want to write rows that, that just don't matter to us. So, so again, when you're, when you're trying to construct a polynomial, take into account what they ask you to do. The less information, the more flexibility you have, okay? And so, so maybe they might just say, well, give, give, write a polynomial with leading coefficient one. So it wouldn't necessarily be unique, but it would have all the zeros in the required degree. We get to the uniqueness because we're forcing these two guys here. Which, which makes a difference in our computation. So, so again, just remember when you're trying to construct a polynomial, that's really easier. When you're trying to deconstruct a factor, that's a harder problem in general. This we can do because we can apply the factor theorem and move it forward. Uh, when, when you're trying to go in the reverse direction, that can be easy or, or extremely difficult. So, so we, we know that this process is, is more straightforward. But again, you, you don't want to make it up. And then you want to look at this and say, does it have all the nice qualities that we're looking for? And it does. So this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. You must follow the instructions in the web assign. You can't change variables at will. If, if, they, if they ask for P of X, that means you must use X as the indeterminate. You can't use T, you can't use S. Some of you just put whatever variable you like and you can't do that. This is a sophisticated computer algebra system and they require that you utilize the, the elements of the problem. The, the web assign can do all kinds of things to check your answer. But if you don't follow the formatting, that's the first line of code. Boom, it kicks it out. 
it doesn't even go into any further. It scans what you do, and if it sees something foreign, it's gone. And 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 just just remember that the computer algebra system insists on the formatting to be followed. Okay. Now, I want to look at another example of building a polynomial. Just kind of like the last one, maybe a little bit easier, but uh, but very similar. In, in the way we want to do this. Because I think these are these kind of give us all the ideas that we need. So let's construct one more polynomial. Here we'll just say build a polynomial or construct and here we have we want degree three zeros will be two square root five. Gosh, if you can do these problems, you can do anything. I'm going to insist that P have energy coefficients. And I want the constant term to be 20. I mean, if you just have to verify the factor theorem or remainder theorem, that's easy. That's synthetic division. That's so simple. And, and I've shown you my technique for synthetic division, which is easy, so you should use it. So now let's just go ahead and do the same thing. Notice I've set this up to work like the last problem to give you some more experience with this. So here we have the zero, and here we have the factor. And you want you can think about multiplicities here with all the last problem. All the multiplicities were one, so the cross the axis and all those cases. So we have two. So we need x minus two. Now, of course, we have square root of five. So I wanted to re-emphasize this. We need we need integer coefficients. So we can't have x minus the square root of five. So now we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to think of the quadratic polynomial x squared minus five, which actually equals x minus root five, x plus root five. This is a very common occurrence with polynomials that we study in this class. And so this technique will carry with you uh, to calculus. So this, this satisfies the requirement of integer. And then, of course, now we have the degree three. So we have a check here. We have a check here. We have a check here and a check here. So now, now you can see the process is very straightforward. So now we have what? x minus 2 times x squared minus 5. Now, you're thinking, you know, it's probably most convenient to go ahead and to write this in descending order, even though you might think it's a waste of time. We do want to go to the descending order just, and then, of course, then we realize why the reverse process is so much harder. So multiply by x, x cubed, and then minus a 5x, and then negative 2 times x squared, and then negative negative, we get a plus 10. So just like before, we can compare the constant term here with this, and this would just say we need to hit this polynomial with a 2. Again, the two not would not change any of the zeros. So now we have two times x cubed minus five x minus two x squared. Oh, I should I should write that in descending order. That's that's kind of slack. Sorry about that. That let me let me write that better. Go ahead and write this in descending order. So now we'll have x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus a 10. So now when we hit this with a 2, we get 2x cubed minus 4x squared minus 10x plus a 20. Now, of course, when you look at a polynomial like this, you see the extra baggage here, you know, you see the extra stuff here, and, and, and that's only because we wanted to do this. But if you started this problem going backwards, the first thing you would do is factor the two, because that's just in the way. 
but but the 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 idea the idea here is when we state our theorems when we state our theorems we have certain hypotheses that must be satisfied and the hypotheses allow us to apply the the result it's kind of like the conjunction rule you know you have to have the absolute value isolated and you have to have less than some positive real number so so we have to make sure that all the hypotheses are satisfied and so now we can just call this uh, p of x so that would be a polynomial that would satisfy these conditions now what i want to do like i said before just in closing If you look at the um, problems in, in both of these sections, you're thinking, what will, what will be the next step here? So, so for instance, let's just, let's just think about a simple problem here. What, what's the next step gonna be? We've, we've got the uh, division algorithm, we've got the multiplicities of zeros, we've got in behavior, we have remainder theorem, factor theorem, the technique of synthetic division, what's going to be the next step here? Well, it's going to be to figure out when we have rational zeros. So let me go ahead and state that result. And, and then, of course, next week we'll dive into that. So here's, here's the next result. It's going to be the rational zeros theorem. You like these exercises. Um, because they're 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 fun and they're they're easy to apply and everything fits together. So for instance, what we're going to do is the following. That is, we're going to say let p of x be an integer polynomial. This is a requirement. We have to start with an integer polynomial, okay, just like we've been doing twos, threes, negative five, things like that, where a sub zero is non-zero. The constant term must be non-zero. Otherwise, you've got x as a factor, and you know zero is a zero. So then you, you factor the x. So we want a non-zero uh, uh, constant term. And then what we're going to do is suppose that the greatest common divisor of p and q is 1. That's what I've used before. That means relatively prime. They have no positive divisors in common except positive one, okay? So, and we're gonna do this in, in um, we do this in reverse. If P of P over Q equals zero, that is, if p over q as a fraction, again, rational zero, then again, these are integers that have greatest common divisor, one. If this fraction is a zero of p, then p divides a sub zero and q divides the leading coefficient. And then, of course, in this problem, we've assumed that p of x equals a sub n x n plus a sub n minus 1 x sub n minus 1 down to quadratic term, linear term, and then the constant term. So again, we think of p over q as a rational zero. That is, P over Q is a rational number. And so this is gonna be the next rung in the ladder, so to speak. We're gonna take the division algorithm, we're gonna take the factor theorem, the remainder theorem, in behavior, all of that, and, and then we're thinking, you know, we, we're even gonna be able to get graphs of more polynomials because we're gonna have a new tool 
that will allow us to find any rational zeros that might exist. Now, of course, when we think of rational zeros, we think of things like two, five, negative one half, rational numbers, numbers that can be written as fractions. So here, here, and I want you to think about this, I want you to see that why, why does this even work? We've worked this problem, and I'll say more about this, we've worked this problem in reverse. We, we look at divisors of the constant term, and we look at divisors of the leading coefficient and work the problem backwards by generating a list of fractions. And then we use synthetic to test. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a very interesting result, which we use in reverse. So this not only will uncover rational zeros, but it will tell us when none exist, okay? So this will be the next, uh, theorem that we cover and that we use in detail. So remember, for your first test, you'll have a window of time from uh, Thursday to Saturday to do that. Uh, we will have no lecture on Thursday. That'll be a free day for you to get some extra sleep, or you can go ahead and take your test during that time. I didn't want to use that time for your test time. Uh, because we're in an online situation, I think it would be too difficult to require everybody to be testing at that time. I want to treat this like an online course where I give you a window of time to complete the test, just like we would do distance learning if we were on campus now. But you all would be coming to the uh, campus to test in our testing center or our testing locations that we set up as professors and, and you'd be doing your test that way. So, so we want to provide the same uh, window of time that gives you more flexibility. So, so the, uh, the test will be available on Thursday, and then you can kind of schedule when you want to work on that. Again, go ahead and complete your work. Uh, go ahead if you like to go ahead and work through this material, or maybe you'll get your test out of the way, then you'll start working on this. Okay, so everything that, um, that you need to know uh, will be is, is listed on Blackboard. Take advantage of the practice test material. Once you finish your web assign and your quizzes and all that, you can do additional work with the practice material just to hone your skills. Uh, I think you'll find that there's more than enough material to keep you busy. Okay, so thank you for your attendance today. I appreciate your time and, and good luck as you as you prepare for your test. Everybody have a good day. Have a good day, sir. Thank you. Have a good day. Same to you. Thanks so much.